Hi, everybody. Welcome to Cockroach Labs. Um, see some familiar faces, see new faces, so thank you for coming. Um, tonight, we're going to be doing a demo of our 2.0 product, which we released last week. Um, then we're going to open the night with that with Nate Stewart. He's our head of product. Uh, around a little after 7, 7.15, we'll then move into a fireside chat with our CEO and co-founder, Spencer Kimball, and Kai Niemi, who's an architect at Kindred. Kindred is a European uh, online gaming company um, that we've been working with since the latter part of 2015, early 2016. Um, they've been a design partner with us, so pretty excited to have them here. They came all the way from Stockholm to be here. Without further ado, Nate. All right. How's everyone doing? Good. 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 Great. So as Jessica said, I'm Nate Stewart, head of product at Cockroach Labs. And somewhere in the audience is Nikhil uh, Benish. I'm one of the members of our uh, core team. And together, we're going to walk you through CockroachDB 2.0. Uh, the agenda is pretty simple. We'll do a quick overview of CockroachDB. Uh, we'll spend the majority of the time covering some highlights in the form of three demos. After that, we'll talk about some performance highlights and we'll compare CockroachDB performance to that of Amazon Aurora. That's uh, pretty exciting there. And then we'll share some other highlights from the release. I'll pause at certain points for questions, but I'll also save time for questions at the end. Sound good? Great. So what is CockroachDB? Uh, CockroachDB is an open source distributed SQL database. It's a database that has no single points of failures. And it's designed from the ground up to support building massive and extremely reliable cloud applications. It has some pretty interesting properties. It automatically replicates your data, rebalances your data, and repairs itself, all while still offering um, distributed ACID transactions. In fact, we offer the highest isolation levels uh, specified in, in the SQL standard. So if you compare that to something like a Postgres, um, you're going to see, um, you won't see the same type of anom anomalies or data integrity issues um, with CockroachDB. And since our 1.0 release, we've seen some really exciting traction in the market. We've seen uh, Tyrion, for example, they are a blockchain company that um, they've created a platform for certifying the authenticity of any type of digital asset. And they use CockroachDB to support the system, which is now doing over 100 million proofs every single day. Uh, Baidu, one of the world's largest internet services providers, um, they got rid of their distributed or their sharded MySQL and replaced that with CockroachDB because, again, they could take advantage of that auto scaling or the automated scaling without having to worry about managing um, a huge uh, set of middleware. And uh, Kindred, who will be talking in uh, just a few moments, is another exciting customer, but I'm not going to steal their thunder. But along the way, in getting these customers and in rolling out CockroachDB 1.0, we've learned some really interesting things, interesting things around how people are working with distributed systems. We found that teams very much want more manageable distributed systems. They want adaptable distributed systems. And they've pretty much figured out how to do that with their uh, stateless services. So you have things like Kubernetes for your container orchestration, Prometheus for uh, monitoring and alerting these uh, large distributed applications, and standards like open, open tracing, so you can start to trace requests even as they uh, cross service boundaries. Those have gone a long way. But the issue that people are having is that their relational databases are still very much a monolith. These relational databases are still stuck on these you know, extremely powerful machines. If you want to scale up, or if you want to scale your relational database, you have to bring that uh, server down, put it on a more expensive, larger machine, and bring it back up. And that, of course, has downtime implications. If anything else happens to that single machine, your application is going to go down. And so people are finding that these uh, traditional relational databases are very much anchors um, that are preventing innovation. They're anchors that are preventing growth. And we think we have a pretty good solution with CockroachDB 2.0. So the goal with CockroachDB 2.0 was to figure out how do we create um, a high performance database that can help your team adapt as they grow and as they encounter new types of challenges. And rather than tell you about this, I'm just going to show you a series of demos. So the way this will work is we'll follow the fictional company mover. They're a peer-to-peer -peer vehicle sharing app. So if you want to get from point A to point B, you can check out a vehicle on mover, use it, and return it back to the pool. And we're going to show 
how CockroachDB helps them adapt to three types of changes. Changes in customer requirements with JSON, uh, changes in customer demand with the ability to scale horizontally with no downtime, and then lastly, changes in customer geography. And we're gonna show how you can set up uh, a global cluster, a cluster that spans uh, regions and serves a global customer base, all while keeping uh, latencies low. So we'll start when Mover was just an idea with a few founders. What they wanted to do was uh, quickly create a prototype, share it with some friends and family, get feedback and iterate on it until they have something that they feel like people like. And that's gonna bring us to our first demo, which is JSON. So the Mover database is pretty simple right now, as you can imagine. There's a vehicles table and it has everything you'd expect. The ID for the vehicles, uh, the type of vehicle, the creation time, status, you know, is it available, is it lost? But um, for this demo, the thing that we wanna focus on is this JSON, JSON type. This corresponds to Postgres JSON B, which means it's JSON binary. This means that to do operations, to do transformations, we don't have to parse the entire JSON document. We can just work with uh, the data that we need. But the, the most interesting thing about uh, JSON in CockroachDB is that for our first release of JSON, we're combining it with the ability to do uh, inverted indices. And this is going to make it really easy to do all types of queries without having to figure out what are those types of questions you want to answer ahead of time. And we'll show how this helps the Mover team iterate pretty quickly. So first, let's start with a basic query. You can imagine this is probably the most uh, popular query on Mover. Someone opens their app. Let me just zoom this out a little bit. There we go. Uh, someone opens their app and says, hey, show me all the vehicles near me. And you see here their scooters, their bikes, and the Mover team with every um, type of vehicle, they're including some metadata about that vehicle. Maybe it's the color, maybe it's the brand. And this metadata, it can be different for different types of uh, vehicles. And so what the Mover team found is that people don't just want any type of vehicle, they want to be more selective. On their way to work, they don't wanna just take a bike, they wanna say, um, I wanna take a Schwinn bike, for example. So with, the, with uh, JSONB and um, Cockroach, you can just use what's called a containment operator, which is saying now, show me all of the documents that contain this sub-document brand equals Schwinn. And again, we're taking advantage of that inverted indice to do this. We didn't have to worry about planning out the index ahead of time. We didn't have to do any alter table. This is just something that we can quickly do, quickly update our service and put it out there. But now let's say that, okay, you know, people like the idea of choosing brand. They like the idea of choosing bike, but now they want to, uh, for example, choose color as well. So maybe we want to put a color picker in that uh, application. Again, we can just make the type of document that we're searching for a little bit more complex. And now we've added a color picker to the app. We've iterated that much faster. And just to show how this works, we'll just do a quick explain on it. And you can see that um, when we're doing this query, we're taking advantage of that index we showed earlier. We're just looking at the subset of uh, documents that contain the data we're looking for, and we're not having to scan the entire table like we'd have to do if this wasn't JSON binary. So that's the first demo, and before I go to the next demo, I want to pause and see if there are any questions. All right, great. So the Mover team is feeling pretty good. They're getting to the point where they're approaching product market fit, and they're starting to see their demand really pick up. And what they're also starting to see is that initial three node cluster that they had provisioned is starting to uh, buckle under this new um, demand. So now we're gonna show how we can scale it out using CockroachDB with some help from Kubernetes. So first let's take a look at this cluster. Okay, so right before the demo, I increased the number of concurrent connections to model um, essentially a doubling in demand. But what we'll see is that if we go to our queries per second, even though the number of connections doubled, the actual queries that the database was able to serve couldn't quite double. We, we started to hit a bottleneck. So now we'll see how we can easily scale out with no downtime. So as I mentioned, we're using uh, Kubernetes to do this orchestration. Um, this is really good because 
Um, Kubernetes can handle things like uh, bringing a node back up if it fails. It can handle things like a service discovery for us. And if you see the nodes that are running in Kubernetes, you'll notice there's no centralized coordinator node. There's no single point of failure. Uh, Kubernetes can route requests to any one of these nodes, and it knows it's always going to get the same response. So essentially, co uh, Kubernetes can treat CockroachDB similar to the way it would treat a, uh, any other service. So now what we're going to do is tell Kubernetes that we want to go from three nodes to six nodes. And for this, we're using what's called a stateful set controller. And all this means is that Kubernetes is going to give us a couple important guarantees. Um, let's just watch this to see what's going on. So what a stateful set controller does for us is it just says, OK, um, I'm going to give you a predictable uh, network identity for these new nodes, and I'm going to give you a uh, persistent storage. So if I have to reschedule a node, that node will still be able to take advantage of that same uh, storage. So what we see is Kubernetes spun up these new containers. The processes themselves are running, but it's also doing a health check to say, OK, CockroachDB, are you ready to handle requests? And as soon as Cockroach says it's ready to handle requests, it can start routing traffic round robin to these new, or actually I think it's random, to these new nodes. All right, so before I show the impact on the cluster, are there any questions about CockroachDB on Kubernetes? No. Nope. All right, we're going to start from the bottom. So we're going to see, let me just make this 10 minutes so we can, there we go. All right, so we're going to see a few things. Um, the first thing we'll see is that the capacity doubled. As these new nodes join this peer-to-peer -peer network, the aggregate capacity of these nodes is now available to the mover database. So we're going from you know, 60 to 120. The next thing we're seeing right here is um, rebalancing. So right now, the three nodes had all of the, the mover data. As each one of these nodes came on, the existing nodes were saying, OK, hey, I see there's a new capacity available. Um, let me see if I can offload some of the work I have to these new nodes so they can uh, participate in the queries. And we can see that it's taking a, a few seconds, but this is just about rebalanced. And once this rebalancing is done, we're going to see a bump in QPS. All right, so that looks good. So now we've seen that CockroachDB has taken the data from three nodes and spread it evenly across six nodes. Each one of these nodes can handle reads and writes. And then what we'll see in about one second, if you just go to a slightly larger time frame, this is going to give us that remaining capacity that was missing. While we're waiting for this next tick, any questions on what you're seeing so far? I know it's covering a lot. So, Phil, I'm happy to answer any questions. How much data we are talking about? So, for this demo, I think this is only maybe a 100 megabyte database. We wanted to keep it small just so the rebalancing could happen while I'm talking. Yeah, that's why I was wondering it happened so quickly. Right? Yes, <laughs> exactly. Otherwise, you guys would be here for 10 minutes looking at the screen. Um, but now we can see, I'm just going to, I'll go back to the 10 minutes one. One second. All right, it's going to need a little bit more time to rebalance. We can uh, revisit it in a second. We see a, a, a slight improvement, but the important thing here, if we go to one of these new nodes that joined, is that as these new no nodes are joining the cluster, if you look at the type of traffic they're handling, they're handling both reads and writes. If you look at a traditional uh, relational database, and even some of these databases that are provided by a, a database as a service like Aurora, you'll see that they can scale out, but they can only scale reads horizontally. Those writes are still being funneled to a single machine. With CockroachDB, each one of these new nodes can handle reads and writes, and that's going to have really big scalability implications um, that we'll talk about in a bit. All right, so we're going to move to the next demo. So the mover team is feeling pretty good. They were able to iterate quickly. They were able to scale their database to meet the demand of their customers. And they were actually able to raise another round of funding. And they're going to use this round of funding to, as most people in this type of business do, uh, get big fast. So they're going to open up a new office in Paris and start to serve uh, a European market 
out of that office. So we're going to show how CockroachDB helps them with that transition. So the first thing we're going to do is see this new cluster that they created. And this is our first enterprise feature that we'll talk about today. It's the new cluster visualization. And the key insight behind this dashboard is that when you're dealing with a distributed relational database, there are new types of questions that you need to be able to answer. For example, what is the role that physical space plays in um, dictating my performance or in dictating the availability characteristics of our cluster? And we found that by plotting this type of thing on a map, it helps people answer those types of questions a little bit faster. You can still do something similar without an enterprise license, but it's just that map visualization just helps you get to the root cause um, quicker. So here we see the new mover cluster. They've taken their initial six node cluster from uh, US West, and they've added additional, an additional six nodes in uh, Europe West too. And by default, what CockroachDB is going to do is spread the data out uniformly across this cluster. And as you can imagine, this is going to have an impact on latency. They want their tail latency, that 99 percentile latency, to be under 20 milliseconds to serve their internal SLA. And we're going to show how they're able to take advantage of a feature called geopartitioning to, to do just that. Now, before we jump into geopartitioning, we need to take a second and quickly explain how CockroachDB manages your data. So the way CockroachDB works is it takes all your data, sorts it, breaks it up into 64 megabyte chunks called ranges, and then replicates each one of those ranges three times by default and spreads those replicas throughout the cluster. In this case, we know that machines one through six are the US machines, and uh, machines seven through 12 are the European machines. So for example, this is going to be a huge, um, this is going to have huge implications on our latency because we have only one replica in the US. So if we're going to do a write, we're going to have to at least go to one other node. So no matter what, anytime we write to this range, we're going to have to pay that round trip cost over the Atlantic Ocean. And obviously, we're not very happy with that. In certain cases, we have New York and Paris data living on the same range. In this case, sometimes reads are going to be going across the ocean. We don't want that. So how would you typically solve this problem? Well, one way would be to uh, shard your database, create a silo for your US customers, a silo for your Paris clusters, but then you lose the ability to query across those silos. You lose the ability to do transaction across those silos. If someone, for example, had a skateboard and they wanted to move it from Paris to uh, the US or from Europe to the US, you would have a, a bit of a problem there. So we're going to show how to use geopartitioning to do this with configuration rather than code. So this is a two-step process. The first thing we're going to do is take that table, that vehicles table that we showed earlier, and we're going to add a partition to that table. And what this is saying is that we want to create a partition, and we want to do it by city, which is a part of the, the primary key. This is the, the primary way that we're um, bucketing users. And we're saying that for the cities, New York, Boston, San Francisco, we want those to live in the partition called North America. And for the city Paris, we want that to be associated with the partition Europe. By itself, this isn't go going to do anything. This is just metadata or a tag at this point. But where the power is going to come from is when we combine it with rules that say for any rows that match this partition, apply some constraint to those records. And let's see how to do that right now. So we're going to SSH into one of these nodes. And we're going to apply two policies. And I'll walk through each one. So all this is saying and let me know if you can see this, is for the database mover, the table vehicles, and the partition that we just talked about, North America, apply this constraint. Any record that matches that partition needs to be constrained to nodes that have been tagged with this key value pair, region equals US West. And we saw on that cluster visualization where that tag started to come into play. And similarly for Europe, we're saying for any record that matches that partition, again, by that city, um, we want to constrain it 
to Europe West 2. So now let's go back to our range view that we showed earlier. And we can see that CockroachDB has made some changes. Two important things happened. Um, the first is that CockroachDB created new range or split up these ranges such that um, no two cities' data um, shared the same range. So now we see Boston has its own range. We see all of those New York ranges are um, now separated. There's no longer that New York-Paris range. Paris has its own range. San Francisco has its own range. But most importantly, look at where these uh, replicas live. Boston, New York, San Francisco, they all live on those US nodes. Paris lives in those European nodes. And as you can imagine, that's gonna have a huge impact on latency. So let's see what happens. All right, we saw a bump in our queries. And our uh, tail latency improved dramatically. Now we're 15 milliseconds on, and that's the tail latency, the median latency is under two milliseconds. And again, this is all from keeping data close to users. No longer having to create shards and silos, now you can just have CockroachDB figure it out at a very fine grain level. If they want to expand to a new country, they just add new data centers, um, add new cities, and CockroachDB will handle that for them. Um, we're really excited about this fit feature because it unlocks some important use cases. We talked about the performance use case, but one of the biggest things that people are talking about right now is the, the GDPR and some of these other data privacy regulations. You can see how a feature like this would be a really important building block to make compliance with that type of regulation uh, very simple. So that's a, something we're super excited about, and I know uh, Spencer and Kai will be covering that in some detail next. All right, so I'm gonna wrap up in a second. We have a couple more things to cover, but what questions do you have? Yes. So when you use the geofencing or yep. geopartitioning, um, you were mentioning that originally it writes 64 meg box. So the question is, I guess, it obviously doesn't, <clears throat> if you have enough data, you'll fill a 64 meg block and then you write it down. But if you don't have enough data, right, because now you start breaking down into like smaller countries and other, um, when does it actually write that block of data and then clone it to the other one? Right, so in terms of how geopartitioning works and splits up those ranges, it's not a function of data, it's a function of the rules. So if you don't have 64 megabytes, if everything lived on a single range, but it had 10 cities in it, CockroachDB would split that up into 10 ranges. So it's, it's gonna honor those rules and constraints. It's not a function of the, the data size itself. Is that what, is that what you're asking? No, no, no. So what I'm asking is, is so it, it's gonna honor the rules, that's fine. Yeah. But what I'm saying is, because you write chunks in 64 meg blocks. So that's now you started, idea. like, when you had less, <laughs> data partition. Now, let's say you have 200 countries. Yep. Now, in some countries obviously has a smaller population. The amount of data going to that country is going to be less than 64 meg. Mm -hmm. So when does that 64 meg block, right, the three clones of it, get written out to, let's say, I don't know, uh, some small country? Do you so, understand that? So the moment that you apply a zone config to a partition for a specific country is when we'll go ahead and split off that range of the key space. And if there's one byte of data in there or 65 megabytes in there, whichever it is, we'll split that off. So there is a little bit of overhead to each partition, but 200 ranges, that's no big deal. I had a question for you. Yeah. <clears throat> so you um, basically mentioned that with the help of geopartitioning, yep. um, the overall latency kind of you know, got improved and everything. But yep. behind the scenes, the data which was meant to be staying in North America stayed in North America. Correct. The data which was meant to stay in Europe stayed in Europe. Correct. So if you want to search for something which is actually physically located in the European data, yep. you're still going to have the latency, right? So I'm just trying to understand that how this yeah. latency can improve. 
Right, so the thing that we're taking advantage of is that certain customers have an affinity to certain types of data. So this, for example, a Paris user wouldn't say, show me all the bicycles in New York. That, that type of query wouldn't make sense to them. They're saying, show me the, the bikes in Paris. And so that's the type of data that's going to be next to them. If you did something like a count star on the vehicles table, then sure, you'd be paying that, um, that cost. But we're, it, it really helps you take advantage of when your users typically need data that is, is close to them. Okay. But the data between those partitions would not be replicated, right? I mean, if I still want to see the information for New York by sitting in Paris, yes. I would not be able to see that with the same latency. You would, you would be able to see it, but the latency would be different, right? It just depends on where that, that data is. Okay. So what we showed in this demo is that CockroachDB is a more adaptive relational database. It's a, a database that can help you adapt to the real types of problems, the real types of challenges that you would face as a growing company or as a company with uh, globally distributed customers or customers that span uh, many regions. So we show JSON, how it helps you adapt to changes in requirements. We showed uh, horizontal scaling with Kubernetes, uh, changes in scale, and then, of course, geo-partitioning that can help you adapt to changes in geography, but also, as we saw, changes in policy as well to uh, help you really easily adapt to some of these uh, local data sovereignty regulations. So I want to quickly talk about performance. We're going to uh, share some of our first benchmarking results. And we had a couple different options for benchmarking CockroachDB. There are a lot of uh, benchmarks available. There's uh, YCSB, there's um, the analytics type uh, benchmarks like TPCH. Uh, we decided to focus on TPCC. It's a, it's a benchmark that's been around for a while, but it's a really great one for understanding um, OLTP performance. And the way it works is pretty simple. It essentially models a retailer that has several warehouses. Each one of these warehouses is doing things like um, handling orders, checking stock, maybe there's a cross warehouse transaction every once in a while. And the way that the benchmark is set up, for a given warehouse, you can only send so many queries per second. And if you want to do more queries per second, you're going to have to increase the complexity of the system and add more warehouses, which of course may result in more types of transactions. And the name of the game here is to figure out how many warehouses can you scale to while maintaining max throughput, the max throughput specified by the TPCC standard. So the first thing we want to show is how CockroachDB 1.1 compares to CockroachDB 2.0. So using a, a three-node cluster, um, 16 vCPUs, um, we saw that with CockroachDB 1.1, we could get to around 750 warehouses before um, we weren't able to add any more to the system. Um, but with CockroachDB 2.0, same setup, we were able to do almost 70% more. Again, same setup, getting to around 1,300 warehouses. So that's a huge perform uh, performance improvement across the board. But what we're, we're really excited about is seeing how big can we go if we don't constrain it to three nodes? What if we could just throw as many nodes as we wanted um, at it? And we wanted to figure out what was the biggest number that we could find from some of our uh, competitors. And so it just so happens that in reInvent 2017, uh, Amazon Aurora shared their numbers when they were talking about how much more throughput they could handle than a standard uh, MySQL instance running an RDS. And they showed that for 1,000 warehouses, they were able to maintain max throughput, no problem. Um, for 10,000 warehouses, though, you saw that they didn't get that linear scaling. In fact, they actually started to, to fall down and had less uh, throughput than their initial number. Well, with CockroachDB 2.0, we were able to beat that by uh, quite a bit. So we maintained max throughput from uh, 1,000 warehouses all the way to 10,000 uh, warehouses. And um, we used a 30-node cluster to do that. The important thing here is that the reason we were able to scale out far past Amazon Aurora is that we weren't constrained to this single node to handle all of our reads and writes. As we wanted to scale out our writes, 
we simply added another commodity machine. We simply added another node, and it was able to uh, take on some of that work. And that's what let us get this nice linear scaling with these transactions across these warehouses um, without missing a beat. So I'm going to pause there because this is um, one of my favorite charts anyway and see if anyone has any questions. Have you done any other benchmarks with other products? <coughs> like other competitors? Have you done any benchmarks against other competitors? Like the NeoDB or? Yeah, so right now we haven't done any benchmarks with other competitors. One of the tricky things about doing a benchmark that's not already published is that we'd have to figure out how do we best tune uh, that database to make sure that it's doing the best it can. Otherwise, they'd say, oh, yeah, you compared against us, but you didn't, you didn't set it up right. We were comparing against Aurora's best numbers that they put on stage and said in front of you know, thousands and thousands of people. So uh, we really focused on that as our primary benchmark. Over time, we're going to start showing how we compare to other types of databases and under other types of workloads. But that's why we focused on Aurora first. Um, you said specifically Aurora MySQL. That's correct. Um, we, didn't, we didn't for the same reason I mentioned uh, earlier. We only have the numbers from published Aurora MySQL. Yes? Um, earlier you gave an example of a data model which uh, it looked like uh, you were modeling uh, most of uh, the data that you would uh, ordinarily want to retrieve in one table. Mm -hmm. In a way that was kind of like a document database, mm -hmm. is that the is that the way that typically uh, people should use CockroachDB if they want to get these kinds of numbers, or are doing joins or subqueries across multiple t uh, tables still a, a, a decent way to uh, to model data? Yeah, that's a really great and important question. Um, we're not focused on making CockroachDB perform well as a document database. We're focused on making it perform well as a general purpose relational database, OLTP database. So TPCC, that's the reason we went with TPCC, because it does have a maybe perfectly normalized schema. It's a pretty normalized uh, schema. It does have those ACID transactions. If we were focused just on the document type workloads, we would have went with a YCSB, but that's not really the type of database we want to build. The reason we focused on that document workload was just to show how, you know, as you're prototyping, you can get some of those NoSQL benefits while still maintaining the relational guarantees that we provide. You'll see those latency numbers on basically any workload that doesn't require pulling in too much data. So as long as you're doing little point lookups or small joins, regardless of whether your workload is relational or document-based, you'll see good latencies. All right. So just to wrap up, um, we have a couple other features. So sequences, that was one of our big requests. Um, on-delete and on-update behavior, so your on-delete cascades, those are available. On the security side, we've improved our story there. We've added role-based access control. And we've also added support for uh, securing your Kubernetes clusters. So if you want to take advantage of their um, authorization or um, you know, their CA workflows, you can do that as well. So just to wrap up, um, we think that CockroachDB is a scalable distributed SQL database that can help grow with you. Um, we really think that with this 2.0 release, we found a, a nice balance between performance and correctness. Um, in some of our competitors, they'll often say, hey, you know, we know serializable is the, the best isolation level to run at. We know that's the correct thing to do. But we recommend that you run at something weaker just so you can get higher performance. But the, the problem with that is that as you get this higher performance, as you start seeing more concurrency, you start to see more of those data integrity issues pop up. That's not something you have to worry about with CockroachDB uh, 2.0. So with that, I have, I think, maybe a couple more minutes to answer questions. But thank you.